Hey everyone, it's Mark and today I'm back with a VFR guide to flying the free Cessna 152 mod that's available from WB Sim and JP Logistics. The 152 is as simple of an airplane as it gets, but there are a couple of subtleties to know about and I'm going to cover how to install it, how to make sure that your engine doesn't conk out, some of the finer details of the autopilot and a whole bunch more little details here and there so that you can get the most from every flight. Let's start from the beginning and how to get this mod. It used to be available from flightsim.to, but because of the whole fiasco that happened there a while back, it's now only available for download directly from the developer's Discord in their official download channel, and I'll have a link so that you can get to that in the description for you. The download is a little bit less than 500 megabytes, and to install it, you're going to want to copy the folder that's inside of that zip to your flight sim community folder which is going to be in a different spot depending on if you bought flight sim from steam or the microsoft store but i'm showing you both paths right now there's no auto update feature for airplanes like this though so make sure that you go back to the discord occasionally to check for updates because it is regularly updated with bug fixes and new features so it's just something to keep in mind especially after we have a sim update it's definitely worth it to check it out if there's been an update for it at that point, you can launch Flight Sim, and in the airplane selection screen, you can filter the list down by typing in 152, and you should see that three JP Logistic planes come up. The first two models are fairly similar. The only difference between them are the fairings on the wheels, which give you an extra three knots at cruise speed. So if you're in a hurry, it could shave off a little bit of time off your flight time, but for short hops, it's not really going to make all that much of a difference. The third model is a tail dragger, which handles differently on the ground for taxi takeoff and landing because of that nose up position. But otherwise, it behaves pretty similarly once it's in the air, so it could be a good choice if you're looking for a slightly different experience. We're going to be doing a tour of the main island of Tahiti to explore the details of the 152, and I'm going to start on the ground by looking at all of the features of the EFB that you should know about which you can actually hide by just clicking in the top left corner of the iPad. And then to bring it back, you just click in that same spot in the top left corner of the panel. It does take about a second or two for it to come back. So don't click it a second time because it'll just keep making it disappear. Let's start with the instrument block. I've got most of them enabled for this flight just because I like having them on board regardless. But if you are going to be doing any type of instrument flying, you're definitely going to have the autopilot, the DME and the ADF enabled. If you have a license for either of the GTN 750s, you'll be able to enable them here. I personally find having a GPS in a plane like this kind of defeats the purpose though. Just be aware, however, that there are a lot of people I've seen in the Discord saying they get crashes to desktop with them, so it's just something to keep in mind if it happens to you. The upgraded transponder is a good one to enable if you're thinking of going on VATSIM with this airplane. Even though I think the default transponder can work too, it's probably best to have something with a little bit more features for VATSIM, especially because you want to be able to make sure that you can ident and squawk mode Charlie. You can only get the EGT gauge by sacrificing the clock. So if you're planning on doing some IFR practice, I'd probably stick with the clock instead just to make things a little bit easier for timings, especially since you only really need the EGT gauge for leaning and you can work around that by using the RPM gauge instead. All right, let's move on to the maintenance block, which is probably the most important section on the EFB to check before and after every flight. The charge battery switch is there if you turned the master power on and you left it on for a really long time before starting the engine because what's going to happen is it's going to drain the battery down and there'll be a little red light below the amps gauge that's going to turn on to say that you're low on volts at which point you can just flip it to on and it'll just recharge the battery. As you fly the airplane around, the oil is going to slightly burn off and if you abuse the engine, which we're going to look at once we're in flight, you're going to burn through a lot more oil quickly. 7 quarts is full and I tend to top it up anytime it goes below 6.5 just to make sure everything runs okay. The engine health is also going to drop slowly from normal wear and tear, but if you push it too hard it's going to drop much faster and you could lose the engine mid-air, and obviously you can only repair it once you're back on the ground. 
Next up in the settings block, I've checked the state saving feature. I really appreciate this feature because it means that it's going to remember the state of absolutely everything that you've done in the airplane the next time you boot back into Flight Sim. So if you're doing a multi-leg trip over multiple Flight Sim sessions, you can pick up exactly where you left off and the plane is exactly how you left it. The realism checkbox just always stays on for me. The whole point of this mod is to make the 152 more realistic and complex to fly, but I always leave the show pilot and co-pilots to off because I don't like the way it looks. Sometimes they're going to block your view of the instruments depending on where you are, but that's going to be a personal preference that's really up to you. The exterior block is where you can put on and take off the engine cover, the wheel chocks and the pitot tube covers. But the trim tab is a little bit different and it's there for you to put in some right or left rudder while you're still on the ground because it doesn't have an adjustable rudder trim once you're airborne. It's basically a tab on the outside of the airplane that you have to hand adjust before your flight. It can be deflected anywhere between 0 and 100% either to the left or right. I haven't found it really necessary to use it though, but you can feel free to experiment with it if you like. On the right hand side of the airplane, we've got our payload just like with any other airplane. The fuel section can be used to adjust how much fuel we have on board in both wings. And you've got your current weights and your max weights shown so you can plan your weight and balance properly. Lastly, if you want to shortcut the startup procedure, we've got two buttons right at the bottom. You've got the cold and dark and the ready for flight buttons. You can use those to get going really quickly in either direction, whether you want to take off or you just want to shut down. Personally, I like going through the whole checklist, but on occasion it does happen that I'm just in a hurry and I'll just press the ready for flight button. All right, let's get the plane running and I'm going to start by switching both of the master switches to on, which is only going to enable the autopilot at first because it doesn't have a separate off switch like all the other avionics do. And it's going to go through its boot sequence really quickly and then the barometer value is just going to be flashing on its little screen. You can adjust it by twisting the altitude knobs and then you can confirm it by pressing the barrel button once. But just remember that even though you've done that on the autopilot, you still need to also set the barometer on the altimeter as well since the two aren't connected. I've got it set to inches of mercury at the moment, but by default it comes in millibars. And to switch it from one to the other, all you've got to do is long press the barrel button. And after a couple of seconds, it's going to change the display and show you that it's switched into the other measurement. While I'm here, I'm also going to set my cruise altitude by again twisting the altitude knobs. Even though I don't really use the autopilot that much while I'm flying this airplane, it's still a good practice to set it in case you need it for whatever reason. It's just easier than having to fiddle with it once you're airborne. I'm also going to set the heading bug to the runway heading now too, so that like that, if I have to quickly enable the autopilot, I can just go into heading mode and the airplane will keep flying my runway heading for me. Next, let's turn on both of the nav radios, the transponder, the ADF, and the DME. And each of them have a little switch that you need to flip so that they turn themselves on. And it's not always super obvious where they are, so I'm just highlighting them for you now. I won't be doing any instrument flying today, but I've got the comm set to Unicom just out of habit. And I've set the nav one frequency to the station that's at the airfield so that I can use it for the DME to be able to time my descent properly. All right, let's get that little engine started. And first things first, we need to turn the fuel valve to on, which is right between the two front seats. And then we can set the mixture to full rich, open the throttle just a little bit, prime the engine once, and now we can just try turning it over. In colder weather, you might need to prime it a second or even a third time, but I haven't run into too much trouble getting air started. Although on one occasion I did have some smoke and it wouldn't want to start no matter what, and I resorted to the ready for flight button on the EFB, which seems to always work in the worst case. Once the engine's running for a couple of seconds, you can lean the mixture just about 20% or so to avoid spark plug fouling, which is simulated in this airplane, so it's important to avoid it because it could cause the engine to run a little bit rough. And then you can just adjust your throttle so that the engine's idling at around a thousand RPM. The important thing to keep an eye on is your oil temperatures. You need to give it a little bit of time to warm up and get into the green section before you go to take off. Usually the time it takes you to get to the runway and do all of your pre-takeoff checks is going to be enough though. 
Speaking of which, let's just turn a couple more lights on for taxiing. We can pull the parking brake to off and we can start getting moving by applying just a little bit more power to get the plane moving, at which point you can back it off again because the plane's so light, it's just gonna pick up speed really fast if you leave the power on. Before we continue with this tutorial, I just wanna remind you to please hit the like button if you haven't already and think about subscribing as well. I publish a new video every two weeks with tips, tricks, and tutorials from Microsoft Flight Sim. Your likes and subscribes are what keep the channel growing and it's gonna help other simmers discover these tutorials as well. All right, I'm holding short of the runway now and I'm just gonna do a couple of last checks before we get going. First off, the oil temperatures are looking good because they're all in the green. And I'm gonna bring the mixture back to full now as well. However, if you are taking off from an airport above 3000 feet, you need to lean the mixture properly before takeoff so that you get the max RPM. I've covered how to do that in a previous video, so I won't cover it here and I'll just have a link to it in the description. I'm not using any flaps at all for takeoff today just because I'm on a really long runway with zero obstructions so I don't need them at all. But if you're taking off from a short runway or somewhere with obstructions you should be using flaps 10 until you're clear of those obstacles and that's just going to help you generate a little bit more lift without impacting your climb speed. The next thing that's really important to check is the trim position because this is something that's saved in the state from flight to flight. So if you didn't reset it after the last time you landed the airplane, you could be in for a surprise when you go to rotate. And I find it works best when it's at the absolute bottom of the takeoff range. The other thing that's worth a quick look is that both windows are closed and locked. And finally, I do a quick controls check because I'm often swapping controller profiles depending on the plane that I'm flying. For takeoff, I usually apply power pretty linearly all the way up to full, and although the engine isn't super powerful in the 152, it's going to get up to speed pretty quickly just because the airplane's so light. The POH for this airplane says that you should rotate at 45 knots, but I find that 50 works a little bit better and it gives me a little bit more speed buildup while I'm still in ground effect. If there were any obstacles, I would use the best angle of climb until I was clear of them, which in this plane is 55 knots. But since there aren't, I'm just going to pitch for 75 knots instead. Even though technically the best rate of climb is 67, I find that little bit higher speed gives me better visibility out of the cockpit. Close to the ground, that's going to equate to about 750 feet per minute in the climb, but as you keep going, it's going to be closer to 500 feet per minute since the plane does lose a fair bit of performance as you continue to climb higher and higher. I'm just about at pattern altitude, so I'll turn the autopilot on now just to show you around. By default, it's going to start in roll mode for your lateral mode, which means that it's going to keep the wings at the bank angle that they were at when you turned it on. So if you were flying straight and level when you turned it on, you'd keep flying straight and level. But if you were had them at any type of bank, it would stay at that bank angle. It should also enable vertical speed for your vertical mode when you turn it on. If it doesn't, you just have to press the altitude button once and the display should change to say you're now in VS mode. And then you can use the up and down keys to increase or decrease the feet per minute it's using. I've also pulled the power back to 2500 RPM now. At full throttle, I found it goes a little bit past the red line, which is fine for takeoff. But if you leave it there for too long, you're risking blowing a cylinder head. So I just play it safe and pull the power out just that tiniest little bit. That said though, as you continue to climb, you're going to need to add some of that throttle back in to maintain 2500 RPM. A normally aspirated engine like this one loses power as it goes higher. So it's really important to keep an eye on it so that you can maintain your climb rate. One thing that I almost forgot about is when you're using the autopilot in vertical speed, you need to press the arm button so that it levels off automatically at the cruise altitude that you set. Otherwise, it's just going to keep climbing past it and you'll get a warning saying that you're leaving your altitude a few hundred feet later.
As I'm leveling off at cruise, I tend to leave the power at 2500 RPM just to get up to my cruise speed a little bit faster, which is actually a little bit slower than what I expected. It's around 100 knots of indicated airspeed and about 110 knots of true airspeed, which you can see on the inside of the airspeed indicator. In terms of cruise altitude, I tend to stick anywhere between 3000 and 6000 depending on the weather conditions, just because anything higher is painfully slow to get up to. But you can go up to 10,000 feet if you really need to as well, it's just going to take a really long time. You're meant to lean the mixture every 3000 feet, I only tend to do it once I get up to my cruise altitude since I don't usually go that high with the airplane, and since all we've got is the RPM gauge, it's going to be approximate anyways. So to lean it, you've got to start pulling the mixture lever out and you've got to watch the RPM gauge very closely because it's only going to be a very slight change. You're going to see the RPMs are going to go up and at one point it's going to stop increasing and it's going to start dropping off, which is the point where you should stop leaning the engine and push the lever back in just the tiniest little bit to get back to that peak RPM. From there, you're set for your cruise and you can just adjust your power wherever you want it. I personally leave it somewhere between 2300 and 2500 for cruise because I like getting there a little bit faster. But if you want something a little bit slower, you could probably go down to 2100 as well. And it'll also make it a lot quieter in the cabin too. For the descent, I use the 3 to 1 rule to just calculate how long it's going to take me to get the pattern altitude. And since I've got the DME on and it's tracking the VOR at the airport, I can easily tell how far out I am, so it's super easy to time it right. I won't cover the details of how to do that calculation here because I've covered it in the past and I'll have links to those videos instead if you're curious. I use around 2300 RPM and an ascent rate of between 500 and 700 feet per minute so I can hold on to as much airspeed as possible for the first part of the descent. I really only slow the airplane down as I'm entering the traffic pattern or once I'm on the final approach course if I'm doing a straight in approach. If you're flying around in cold weather, you should also be adding some carb heat when you cut the power below the green band of the RPM gauge. That's going to prevent ice from forming inside of the carburetor. And then once you bring the power back up, you can push the carb heat back to off. Also, don't forget as you're going through 3000 feet that you need to bring the mixture back to full rich so that you can get the max power from the engine in the case you have to do a go around. It's really easy to forget about this one, which is why I use my custom checklist for the 152, which is available for free on flightsim.to if you're interested. Approach in this plane is fairly straightforward and things happen so slowly anyways that you've got plenty of time to adjust even if you screw it up a little bit. I usually add in the first notch of flaps when I'm on the downwind leg or if I'm doing a straight in approach when I hit a thousand feet above the airfield and I'll set the power so that I slow down to 80 knots at around 2300 RPM. As I start descending towards the runway is where I'm going to go to flaps 20 and by then you can also start thinking about slowing down even more towards 70 knots but you should only need a very slight power change to achieve that. And it's always best to get to your final landing configuration early. For me when I'm doing a straight in approach it's at around 700 feet because the flaps cause a change in lift and drag and it can destabilize your approach for a couple of seconds and doing that too low to the ground is just a recipe for screwing up your landing. You can back the power off slowly as you continue towards the runway and let the airspeed bleed itself off to about 65 knots on short final. I tend to keep some power on until I go past the runway threshold, at which point I'm going to bring it back to idle and just start a very gentle flare so that the plane slows down to 55 knots and it should let the main gear touch down first. The nose should come down on its own, at which point you can apply the brakes, but be gentle because going too hard on the brakes can cause a shift in the center of gravity, and if there's strong winds, you can end up in a pretty precarious position. 
that's going to cover it for flying the 152. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments below. I'd be happy to hear from you. Otherwise, please make sure to hit the like button on your way out and subscribe so that you don't miss out on the next video.